part of what we wanted to do uh, today is, is have uh, maybe a little bit of a, a, a treat, at least I would think it would be a treat. Uh, you may have uh, recognized uh, uh, three old familiar faces, and I mean that in every way that it sounds. Um, but we, uh, we wanted to have the uh, three uh, living former directors come and speak. They did so much, and, and, and obviously uh, we could name several others, especially Brother Meadows, who, who, who did so much to help uh, this school uh, to last and to be uh, the uh, force for good that it has been. And uh, we, uh, it, we thought it would be very nice to hear from these three men. And the first one uh, is our speaker this hour, Brother David Leip. And Brother Leip uh, is a graduate of Freed Hardeman and then ultimately received his PhD from the University of Tennessee. Uh, he was a professor at Freed Hardeman in, in the Bible and philosophy uh, departments from 1990 until 2010, um, and also directed their annual Bible lectureship for uh, a good many years. And then from 2012 to 2015, uh, he was the director of the East Tennessee School of Preaching and Missions slash Southeast Institute of Biblical Studies and, and really did a number of good things that, that made my job when, when uh, I became director a whole lot easier uh, than it otherwise would have been. And, and just to say a few personal things about uh, Brother Leip and, and his good wife, Linda, um, they have been uh, great friends to me um, they have been just tremendous blessings uh, to, to not just to me, but to my wife and my children. And, and I cannot thank the Lord enough uh, for uh, knowing them and, and for their friendship. And so without taking up any more of his time, uh, and I invite you to give your attention to Brother David Leip. Well, good morning to you. I'm very glad to be here once again. I always uh, feel like I'm coming home here. I uh, worked here in the 80s for uh, <clears throat> a few years, and then uh, a few years ago as, as director, as Brother Will pointed out, and so uh, my heart's always been real uh, close to uh, the Carnes congregations. Good to see a lot of, of uh, former friends of mine, and I think some of them are still my friends. <laughs> And, uh, but at any rate, I think we have a good crowd and hope that you'll be able to stay for the lectureship uh, this week and looking forward to getting to visit uh, with you and um, see how your work is going where you are uh, laboring. All right, have you got your Bibles? May I see them? Okay. I was at a congregation recently. I've, I'm telling you about half of them didn't even have Bibles. I told them at the church, you know, buy them a Bible if they needed one. And I don't know how the church felt about that. They never did tell me. But at any rate, bring your Bibles. Isn't that right? Amen? Amen? We need your Bibles. Okay. It is a commonly held view that mutually exclusive truth claims are equally va uh, valid. Accordingly, there is uh, more than one way of uh, looking at things as to whether they are true or not. Nothing really ever is indeed truth. And I've got on the uh, screen a couple of statements by some theologians that uh, uh, many Bible students are aware of. And I just want to call out uh, one of them in particular, and that's by Grant uh, Osborne. And I'd like for you to uh, follow with me as I read this to you. Hardly anyone at any time conducts a purely objective search for truth. These biases plus the unbelievable plethora of options available in our pluralistic world make it difficult, if not impossible, to determine which theological option is actually best, let alone which is true in the sense of final or absolute truth. Now, that's sort of the situation that we find in the religious world today, and I find it more and more uh, commonly held to in the Lord's church itself. And so the assignment given to me 
uh, concerns the absoluteness of truth. And here's the way that I have divided uh, up my lesson. First of all, we want to raise the question, what is truth? And then we're going to ask the question, is it objective? Then, is it absolute? Then, is it attainable? And then finally, must it be obeyed? So that's the procedure that I'm going you know, to uh, be following. I want to give you an illustration to uh, show you the absurd situation that we find ourselves in the world today. Let's say that your child is very, very sick. Let's say that the child is vomiting, running a high fever. You rush the child to the hospital and you get uh, three different opinions by three different doctors. Dr. Jones looked at your child and he says, well, your child has viral meningitis and must be put uh, into isolation immediately and treated with some powerful antibiotics. Otherwise, your child is going to die very, very soon. Well, Dr. Smith looks at the child and, and uh, he says, oh, your child has a 24-hour uh, bug and uh, simply needs to be given an injection uh, to bring the fever down. Take him home and don't worry about it. Then Dr. Brown examines your child and Dr. Brown says, well, there are really two different ideas about your child's illness and who am I to say, you know, which one is right? I suggest that what we do is be guided by love and agree to respect each other's opinion. Now, how would you feel about that if that was what was said concerning your child? I suspect you'd be like me and you'd put your foot down and you'd say, no, that's not, what, that's not the way it's going to be. You would want to know with absolute certainty what is wrong with your child. You'd want to know that. Everybody understands that when it comes to something, you know, like this illustration that I have given you. Yet this is the kind of ridiculous thinking that we have. Unfortunately, I'm finding it even, you know, in the Lord's church. We're told that we cannot really ever learn the truth. We're told that we really cannot be absolutely certain that <clears throat> something is absolutely right or absolutely wrong. Uh, we're told, well, just, you know, be sincere, do whatever you uh, wish to do, uh, whatever pleases you, but be sure that you're sincere uh, about it. Uh, one person said to me, well, who am I to say that instrumental music really is right or really is wrong? And see, this is how what I'm talking about is so profoundly important. If we cannot establish that there's something called truth and something that is absolutely true, then, you know, the floodgate is open for about anything that you can imagine uh, in uh, our service to God. And so let's look at these points that I have um, already mentioned to you. So let me have the next slide, please. What is truth? Turn your Bibles with me, please, to the book of John, chapter 18. In verse 36, uh, the Lord said, this is in his discourse with Pilate. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? Many have speculated as to really what Pilate was asking here or in what manner he was asking. I think he's being rather cynical in his response to Jesus when he raises the question, well, what is truth? It's almost like, well, what is truth anyway? You know, what does it amount to? We really can't understand the nature of this subject today unless we look at some different views about truth. There's one view called a correspondence theory of truth. And what that view says is <clears throat> that, okay, if we got settled down, I can't compete with rackets. Okay, maybe it's okay by now. All right, thank you. <clears throat> What the correspondence theory of truth says is this. 
A given proposition is true if it corresponds to reality. So let me give you a simple example. The sun is shining outside. That's the proposition, okay? Now, is that proposition true or false? Well, how would we establish it? Well, Tony, what we'd have to do is go outside and see if the sun's shining. If the sun is shining, then guess what? The proposition's true. If it's not uh, shining, then the proposition is false. Another theory of truth is called the coherence theory of truth. What this says is that a given proposition is true if it fits with, a, um, with other propositions in a given body of factual information. Uh, in my several decades of teaching, I have graded countless term papers. And frequently I have written, say, for example, on page eight of a term paper, incoherent, see page four. Okay, now what am I saying? What am I saying to the student? If I say incoherent, see page four. What I'm saying is, is that what you have written on page four, uh, page eight does not fit with what you said on page four. You see, it's incoherent. The, the two propositions are mutually exclusive. And then there's what's called the pragmatic theory of truth. And what that says is that a given proposition is true if it works. Now, while the coherence and pragmatic theory of truth may be good test of truth, they really, you know, are not um, sufficient in order to define truth. If we're going to define truth, we're going to have to believe in what is called, as I mentioned, the correspondence theory of truth. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have a lot of difficulty uh, with. And so, in the Bible, a statement is true if it fits reality. That's, that's the view that we hold to. A statement is true if it fits uh, reality. The Bible claims, you know, to have uh, truth. It claims to be truth, right? Jesus said in John 17 and 17, thy word is what? Truth. Uh, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1 and 3 that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. And Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3 and 16, all scriptures given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be complete. And so I have the truth right here in my hand. This is what is true. Number two, is Bible truth objective? That'd be the next slide, please. Is it objective? Some people claim that the truth of the Bible is true in the sense that it is especially meaningful to them. I was sitting in a class one day, a Bible class, Sunday morning Bible class. And so uh, a statement in the Bible was read by the teacher in class. And then... such and such. And then another one would say, well, I don't see that at all. What it means to me, and Steve, I just heard all of it I could stand. And I felt kind of bad because I was a visitor at this given congregation. And as a visitor, you know, normally we would just, you know, sort of sit in the back and, and listen and so forth. But I couldn't control myself. And I finally said, listen, what it means is what it means. I mean, you ain't got to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. But you see, the very idea when a person says, yeah, but it means this to me. And then it means this to me. And so forth. It takes away from the objectivity, you know, of the truth. It is claimed by such people that the stories, for example, of Jonah or the stories of the plague or the stories of the exodus, the stories of Jesus' miracles, the story of his death, his burial, his resurrection are true if they're meaningful to you. But they could be false if they're not meaningful to someone else. Now that's far from what the Bible teaches, isn't it? This is just plainly false. And I just think about uh, implications of this. Um, a person might say, well, now what we're really interested to hear 
in is the spiritual message. Okay, I would admit that the spiritual message is incredibly important, but the spiritual message is in a historical setting. And if we can't be certain about the historical setting, how can we be certain about the spiritual message? And so it, it's abundantly clear to me that we've got to be certain you know, about both of these. Why is that? Because this is the truth. You know, Titus 1 and 2, 1 Samuel 15, 29, Hebrews 6, 18, all of these verses say God cannot lie. You see, God is not going to tell us X in one place in the good book and tell us not X in another place. He's not going to do that. Why? Because he cannot lie. In the 70s, I had a debate with a United Pentecostal preacher, and we were discussing the Godhead, and on that night, he said that the Holy Spirit you know, was uh, working in all denominations, confirming the various teachings. And I said, now just think about that. You know, Acts 5, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is God, correct? Of course, okay. And I said, now just think about what you're saying. If the Holy Spirit endorses X in a given religious group and then endorses not X in another religious group, then what have we got here? See, we've got contradiction. I said, think about the implication of that for God Almighty. You see, it's an insult to God, you know, to say that his book can mean one thing in one place and say it means another thing in another place. The truth, the Bible, is objective. It is something that can be transferred to other people. You see, it's not, listen to me, are you listening? It's not dependent on my mind. It's not dependent on the knowing subject, if you will. It is objective. It's outside of my mind. It can be transferred to someone else. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you. Now watch him in verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he arose again on the third day according to the scriptures. So what's Paul saying? Paul is saying, I received something myself and I'm delivering it to you. You see, that makes it pretty clear that it's independent of my mind. You see, it can be transferred. It's objective. It can be um, given to you, given to another person. The church supports the truth. This objective body of information, the church supports that. Uh, Paul said it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 and 15. These things write unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry long, that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. Watch it. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So the church supports the truth, this objective truth. Number three. <clears throat> Bible truth is absolute. Let's look at this slide. Thank you. It is popular in a, in a pluralistic society in which we live to claim that there's no black and white. Uh, everything's just, you know, shades of gray. Everything is relative. May be true for you, but it's not true for me. You see, when you start hearing things like that, <clears throat> there ought to be things that go off in your head thinking, you know, well, what kind of view of truth does this person, you know, have? And so what I would like for us to do is look at some claims that I, you know, researched and found to support that Bible truth is absolute. First of all, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, the Bible makes it clear that we must choose, watch it now, between truth and error. As soon as you say that, you're saying that you've got this body of information over here called what? The truth. And then you have another body called what? Era. Jesus said, enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be who go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and there is the way that leads to life and few that be that find it. And so what's the Lord saying? He's saying there's two different ways you can go. You can go the way of truth or you can go the way of error. Furthermore, the gospel may not be heeded to. Now think about this. The gospel may not be heeded to. We want people to heed to it, but it may not be heeded to. 
In Romans 10, Paul said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring gladdings, tidings of good things. Now watch this in the next verse. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Now what does that say? You see, what that is saying is that the truth cannot be heeded. The truth can be heeded, but some will not you know, heed to the truth. Number three, we must preach the gospel. See, again, I'm talking about something that's objective. You see, it's outside of my mind. It's not dependent on how I feel about it or how you feel about it or anything. It's out there, okay? Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some who trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So what is Paul saying? <clears throat> he is saying that there is this thing called the gospel. <clears throat> it's not necessarily dependent on my mind and there are some who can preach what is not the gospel, okay? So the gospel's absolute. Some not believing the truth will be deluded. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> the apostle Paul again tells us this when he says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be condemned to believe not the truth, but took pleasure in unrighteousness. Furthermore, we find that the faith once delivered can be defended. Jude wrote in Jude 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you concerning the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you that you should contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered. See, the faith, it's not just my, my faith, your faith, it's the faith, you see, like the truth. You see, that puts it out there, okay, objective, absolute. And then again in 1 Peter 3 and 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason you know, of the hope that is within you. So there is something that we can preach, people can ask us about it, and we can give an answer, you know, to it. One may err from the truth, James chapter 5 and verse 19, if any of you do err from the truth. One may suppress the truth. In Romans chapter 1, you remember after the basic theme is set out in Romans, which is uh, most people agree that it's verses 14 through 17, then in verse 18, Paul starts to talk about the need for God's righteousness, the need, you know, for man to be made right. And he, first of all, talks about the Gentiles. And so in verse 18 of Romans 1, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What does that say? That is saying there's this thing out here, it's body of information, and it can be suppressed. All right, let's, the, the point of all of this then is what? The point of all of it is there's a right and there's a wrong. And I know all of you agree about this, and I know that you might, some of you might be sitting there and saying, well, that preacher's not telling me anything I don't already know. But I'm telling you that there are many people in the world who don't believe like we're believing today. You see it all the time. You see it in television. You, uh, I actually heard during <clears throat> the last presidential election, you know, one person said uh, uh, concerning a, a person who was running for a given office, well, he has his truth, and it doesn't agree with uh, so-and-so. He has his truth. Well, guess what? It's either true or it's not true. <laughs> you see? 
It's not, well, he's got his truth and he's got his truth. That's just not the case. Is it right or is it wrong? Take a lie, for example. Is a lie right or wrong? A lie is wrong, right? Well, what if you go to the moon and tell a lie? It's wrong. I don't care if you go to Mars and you tell a lie. It's wrong. Yeah, but Brother David, there's these extenuating circumstances. It's still wrong. Now, I'm not telling you that we might always, always have, you know, the courage to tell the truth in every instance in our life. You know, we might be deceptive. You know, God forbid. But if indeed we ever do that, guess what? It's still wrong, you see. A lie is a lie. That's the significance of what we're talking about. And then number four, Bible truth is attainable. So here's a person who may say, look at the next slide, please. Here's a person who might say, well, even, David, if the Bible is God's word, even if the Bible is the truth as you're saying that it is, we simply cannot grasp it. Have you ever heard that? I have. We, it, we, it's so deep, we just can't grasp it. Well, let me first of all be the, you know, the first person to say that I'm going to go to my grave without understanding a whole lot about the Bible. And you will as well. All right? And, of course, there are some deep things of God, right, that we'll never understand. Brother Farr knows that quite well. He's, Brother Farr has forgotten more about the Bible than I'll ever know. But at any rate, just think about what this is saying now. Even if the Bible is God's word, we cannot grasp it. Now think of the implications of that. Are we saying then that God would give us a revelation that we cannot understand? You know, here's God who wants us as his children. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And he, so he sends uh, this good book to us so we can know what to do in order to be saved. He sends his son to die, you know, for us. But guess what? We can't figure it out. What does that say about God? It's an insult to him. You see... We are made, God made us such that we seek um, happiness, really, if you think about it. I think every man, every woman is given by God this, um, this kind of uh, itch, if you will. And even certain philosophers have pointed this out, as well as psychologists. For example, Carl Jung, a Swiss psychologist, said that in every man there's a hole in his soul. A French philosopher by the name of Pascal said that in every man there is a vacuum, a vacuum to fill. And my favorite theologian, Augustine, said, our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. What are all of these men saying? What all these men are saying is this, we are so made such that we seek something outside of ourselves. See, the very fact that, that people find themselves in immorality or they find themselves in alcohol or drugs or materialism or whatever, you name it, okay, that underscores the fact that we're looking for something. But like the old song says, we're just looking for love in the wrong places, right? Right? And so people are seeking to be happy, but they're seeking to be happy, you know, in some place where they're not going to find happiness. And Solomon's already told us about that. And as Christians, we, we've got, you know, inside information, don't we, that the world doesn't have. We have the good book that tells us, listen, you're not going to be happy until you have a good relationship with God. That's what it boils down to. And Solomon tells us, he says, I've done it all, boys, and it's all vanity. The truth is something that we can attain. Jesus said, you can know the truth. I graduated, as Will announced, from the University of Tennessee and in philosophy. Someone said, well, but what was your degree in? I said, 
in philosophy. So it's a doctor of philosophy? I said, yes. They said, what discipline? I said, philosophy. It's a doctor of philosophy in philosophy, okay. But at any rate, I took some, listen, if you want to, that discipline has got the wildest courses in it, okay. And more than once, I heard things like, well, you can't really know anything with absolute certainty. And as I have advised my students who've gone into doctoral programs, I've said, play the game. I said, don't try to convert your professors. I said, you're not going to do it. I don't mean to be discouraging to you, but that's not going to happen. I said, you can always write in your essays and your papers and so forth according to the thesis of this course. I mean, I, I've attended Catholic universities, and, and I've said, according to uh, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, blah, blah, blah. And see, in that way, I don't, I don't compromise. But I would hear things like, well, you can't really know the truth. You can't really know anything. And you know what I did? I played the game, and I left, and I said, well, I know God exists. Here's, here's my reasoning. It's always been my reasoning. God exists. The good book is his word. Are you with me now? And the book says what it says. And Jesus said what? I can know it. And so I don't care what philosopher you put in front of me who says I can't know anything or whatever. I always go back to what the good book says. You can know the truth. It's attainable. Very, very clear. Paul said in Ephesians 5 and 17, we can understand the will of the Lord. Furthermore, in John 17, 20, 21, now get this. Here's the Lord Jesus staring death in the face. He knows his disciples are vying for position. They're arguing with one another as to who's the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus says in his prayer in John 17, he prays for himself, then he prays for the apostles, and then he prays for me and you. And he said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also who believe on me through their word, that is the apostles' word, that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus said the world can believe. So that means that it is attainable. Finally, number seven, Bible truth must be obeyed. You can hear what I've got to say today. But if you don't obey it, then what good has it done in your life? Peter said, seeing then you've purified your souls in obeying the truth. See, again, something outside of my mind. It's objective. It's absolute. And you know the verse, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who, what, does the will of the Father. Or Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, so the truth can be obeyed. And so, in light of these findings, <clears throat> I want to ask a few, uh, I want to ask this. In light of these findings, what about this claim? Well, one's religious beliefs don't really matter as long as we're sincere. Well, I think uh, Saul of Tarsus teaches us, you know, that it matters. He was pretty sincere, wasn't he? Acts 23 and 1, 24, 16. He lived in all good conscience, but he was wrong. I think the man of God in uh, 1 Kings and 13, who thought he was doing the right thing, he was pretty sincere, but he found out on his way home when a lion met him and uh, killed him that sincerity alone won't do it. What about this claim? Well, one church is just as good as another church. Well, you know, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say he's going to build churches. He's going to build my church. And then Paul said it this way, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is above and all and through all. There's one body. It's ridiculous to claim that you could have one body that's got all kinds of different fruits, as it were, you know, that were being yielded. Just think about that. Have you ever, just watch this just for a minute, listen to them. Are you listening? Have you ever, are some of you gardeners, have you ever?
you ever heard of someone going out and saying, I do not get it. I planted cucumbers this year, and I thought, one year, surely, I'd get some cantaloupe. <laughs> you never have heard that, have you? You see, cucumbers make cucumbers. Cantaloupes make cantaloupes. Dogs make dogs. You can take a, a Pekingese and a poodle and get a pick of poo, but you can't get a cat. <laughs> cows make cows. And so it's ridiculous to think that the Lord would build a church that would have this, this uh, body over here saying, well, baptism is not necessary for salvation. And then another one saying, well, baptism is necessary for salvation, but they may both be right. Let's just all respect each other and love one another. You see how ridiculous it is? But that's the situation that we're in. And why is that? Because of a misunderstanding about the truth. And then finally, what about this claim? One can be saved without being a member of the church. And hath put all things under his feet, and given him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The husband's head of the wife is Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. So does it make a difference? Does it make a difference what your religious belief is? Does it make a difference what church you go to? Does it make a difference whether you're a member of the body of Christ or not? I think in the light of these findings that I've suggested to you today, it makes an incredible difference. Thank you very much. Amen. <clears throat>